Hey folks, Darren with Fervent Astronomy. Today I want to touch on a lens that came out recently, the Viltrox 16mm f1.8 full frame lens currently for Sony E-mount. This wide angle lens with a fast aperture does seem like it would be useful for astrophotography, but I couldn't really find a good astrophotography specific review. Uh, so, you know what? I just decided I would make one myself. This lens is off the shelf. This is not sponsored in any way by Viltrox or sanctioned, uh, mind you. So we're going to put the lens through its paces, be as hard on it as we can, and see how it performs. Now to briefly touch on the build quality and outer features of this lens, uh, I will admit I didn't think that a Viltrox lens would be this well made and good feeling in the hand. Um, perhaps it's a bias on my part, but this lens has a mostly metal body from what I can tell. It's got a nice satin finish, very similar to almost a vintage SLR lens if you uh, are into film photography like that. And it's got a number of modern features that actually uh, helps it keep up with some of the uh, contemporary companies out there making third-party lenses. Uh, of course, very in vogue is the mechanical aperture ring here. Of course, if you don't like using that, you can keep it in auto. There's a bit of a detente there. It's not overly strong, so I can see that it would be pretty easy to knock it out of the auto mode, so keep that in mind. Uh, there is not, unfortunately, a locking switch for that, but there is a declick switch, which you can use to declick the aperture. Great for video, not really relevant, of course, for astrophotography, but it is there if you're doing double duty. We've got two custom function buttons here. Of course, the manual autofocus switch, which, of course, I've got set on manual. And the manual focus ring here feels all right. It's um, actually, from what I can tell, also made of metal. Uh, nicely knurled, so it's got a good grip to it, even though there's no rubber. And it's not... It's not sloppy, but I wouldn't say that it's uh, very sticky either. So uh, it's got a bit of a smooth, it's got a bit of a smooth turn to it. Might be your thing, might not. In my experience, it was workable and, uh, you know, it's going to please some people and not others. If you take the back cap off here on the flange, we've got a USB-C port right below the contacts. So you can interface with computer and presumably update your firmware, etc. And there is a rubber gasket around the edges, which is good for keeping out dust and moisture. It, you know, I'm not sure that it's ready to uh, rumble out in the desert in Utah or anything, but uh, this lens does seem like it could hold up fairly well to some light dust and moisture. Lastly, of course, we have this uh, LCD screen for displaying things like hyperfocal distance and that type of information. Admittedly, I didn't want to put in the time to figure out how to turn it off, if it can be turned off. So during my testing, I actually found it kind of intrusive. It was pretty bright. Um, so if there is a way to turn that off, super. If not, black electrical tape is your friend. The hood is a petal-shaped hood, and it's made out of plastic with a bit of a metal vanity ring. It's actually quite nice. We've got a plastic lens cap, of course. And here we have a 77 millimeter filter thread. So if you are going to be using it for any other things besides astro astrophotography, or if you are the type who likes to put a protective filter on, you can do that. All in all, I, I gotta say, I'm impressed. The build quality is real nice. The lens itself is fairly heavy, which I mean, depending on how you wanna look at that is a good thing or a bad thing. And yeah, just impressed. Now, build quality is one thing, but optical performance is another. So we're gonna put this lens through its paces and see how it performs. All right, all right, all right. As Matthew McConaughey would say, welcome to Lightroom. I've got a few samples here that I'll bring you through. This is gonna be mostly off the cuff, so forgive me for that, but you know we have some pretty decent samples here and you will be able to actually download those samples if you check the description. I'll have a link down there. Just want to make sure that you get a chance to see things for yourself. Pixel peep if you want, process them if you want, compress them into teeny weeny little JPEGs, see 
print them out, et cetera, et cetera. Get a good sense for if this is the lens for you. That said, I know these aren't great works of art, but I do hold the copyright, so please don't reproduce them, post them online, share them, claim them as your own, et cetera, et cetera. Let's grab these first five here. These are shot on a Sony Alpha 1, approximately 50 megapixel sensor. This is on a tripod, so no tracking. The camera can take about 15 second exposures before Star Trail started to show up. So they're all done there at 15 seconds, and the ISO is at 500. So Sony cameras, almost all of them for the last few years, have dual gain sensors. Essentially, there's only two analog amplification stages, and in the case of the A1, that's ISO 500. Going up above that has no effect other than locking you in at whatever the highlights are exposed at. If you come down here to ISO 500, you can adjust the exposure to your heart's content in Lightroom afterwards, or camera raw or whatever, and you will get the same results, except you will maintain your highlights. So if there's stars that are blown out at 2000 ISO, but at 500 ISO, they're fine. Here, this is sort of the background behind why we're doing that. The other 10 photos here, these are shot with the Sony a7R5. This camera has approximately 60 something megapixels. Here, uh, we did 60 second exposures because this is tracked with the light track uh, two from Fornax mounts. Fervent Astronomy happens to be Fornax's official and exclusive distributor in North America. And if that tracker is of interest to you, please head over to our website, fervenastronomy.com. But you can see here, 60 second exposures at ISO 320. This is the second uh, base ISO, or I guess um, native ISO for the A7R5. And that's the one that I used here. And these uh, more blue looking photos here, this was done a little bit more, I would guess, in nautical twilight. And this is a corner test. But let's start here with the tripod shots. So first things first, we notice there's actually quite a lot of vignetting. It is pretty dark in the corners. Now I've adjusted the exposure. I've tried to normalize it uh, to clear the left side of the histogram just so that we're not clipping anything. In all the photos but I haven't applied corrections or anything like that so this is right out of camera essentially. Lightroom doesn't support a correction profile for this lens yet but it is supported in Adobe Camera Raw 15.4.1 and here we can see this is the image that we were just looking at corners are pretty dark turn on the profile corners lighten up a bit vignetting is improved you can see down here at the preview uh, if that helps, the corners are just a little bit dark, didn't completely clear that up. We also see that the profile is correcting some geometry, so there is some pin cushion distortion happening, and some uh, both in the center and in the corners here. Turn that on again, just to give you an idea. So what's interesting here is that some of the mid-frame isn't actually responding, so it appears like it's pretty distortion free and sort of a donut and the center of the donut and the edges do uh, clean up and the geometry changes a little bit. That said, you don't really lose much of your field of view. So if you can see here, watch this star right here on the right hand side, it's not really going anywhere. The corners stretch out a little bit to correct that distortion, but all in all, I think that's actually a pretty good showing. Uh, at 16 millimeters, you don't want to lose any uh, field of view. And it looks like you don't even relying on the software corrections here. And if we zoom in on the center here at 400, we can see there are some star trails, of course. And this sort of pattern that you see, that's Sony's spatial filtering algorithm, which is designed to cut down on noise and clean up any hot pixels. Unfortunately, it does not discriminate between hot pixels and stars sometimes. So in specific cases, you can get uh, weird shapes or some dimming and that type of thing. But uh, in this type of image where you're getting star trails, it's actually less of a concern because it's spreading it out over a few pixels. And just the way the spatial filtering works, you dodge that. Uh, 
You might know it by another name, Star Eater. Very scary, but don't be afraid of it. There's not a whole lot going on there. Here we can see we've got a little bit of chromatic aberration. It's not bad at all. It's not corrected by just the automatic choice there, so we can just bring the dropper and you see it's gone. So I don't think chromatic aberration is a concern. So we'll scroll through here, 1.8, f2, f2.2, f2.5, f2.8. Here, the exposure across the frame has cleaned up a bit actually, so you don't get that bright spot in the middle and uh, the vignetting has cleaned up a little bit. It's a little more consistent, but it is still there. It's pretty dark here if you look. Uh, just let this load. It's very close to black, whereas in the center here, you know, we have, uh, this is probably astronomical twilight. So, you know, that is what it is. At f1.8, you can expect a lot of vignetting. Now let's come over to the tracked samples here. These, again, are tracked for 60 seconds. And if you look here, the stars are pretty round. You can see that this one has a little bit of that uh, chromatic aberration. However, um, what I don't really see, which is nice, is a lot of spherical aberration. That's where the stars bloat out and get all fuzzy. This, you know, just, you can see a faint loss of contrast around, uh, around the star here, but that's not a huge deal at all. And that chromatic aberration, that's easy to fix. It's not a big deal. And of course we have that vignetting. It's pretty extreme in this case. It looks like a long exposure. You know, you are getting a lot more exposure in the center than you are on the edges because again, this is almost black. We already covered distortion, chromatic aberrations. Let's take a look here. A lot of you folks might be going, what about coma? What about coma, Darren? Well, a lot of people actually don't really understand what coma is. Coma or chromatic aberration is when a star doesn't just change shape, but rather you'll have a bright point and then you'll have essentially a diffuse tail like a comet. Chromatic aberration and coma come from the nomenclature of comets. And in this case, uh, I don't see any. You might be thinking, oh, well, it's this. It looks like it has a tail. It's not quite the same thing. And coma always either points away, external coma, or toward internal coma from the center of the frame relative to where it's located around the edges. But what you are seeing in those weird shapes is something called astigmatism. We'll find an example right here. Here you're seeing some different geometry and this is tangential and sagittal astigmatism. And these two types of astigmatism are what happens when the lens tries to focus this pinpoint of light into a single spot but can't quite do it. They are related but not dependent on one another. So when we stop down we can actually affect one more than the other. One can clean up, one can change, uh, for example. So they're not always linked in that way. Some lenses can have really bad tangential or really bad sagittal or both. And in this case, here you can see uh, the telltale fighter jet slash bird kind of shape. We've got that tangential towards the center of the frame. Uh, so basically radiating again out from the center towards the edges and the wings uh, here are sagittal astigmatism and they uh, follow the same plane you know around the center so they're always at a right angle uh, more or less and here there's a lot of it's almost like a star doubling here which is interesting and we've got some different shapes to the astigmatism happening so there's definitely uh, possibly some shenanigans going on inside that lens. You will notice, and it's more prevalent here, or more visible in the preview image, that the left side vignetting is a lot thicker than the right side. So there is a lack of symmetry here. And you know, we see that same lack of symmetry, of course, with this astigmatism, the shapes change depending on where you are in the frame. Uh, you can see, however, that there is a fair amount of astigmatism even in the midframe. You know, we're not at the edges at this point. We're a healthy ways in, into the frame. And these stars are experiencing a lot of aberrations. And 
Yeah, it looks like this copy is not very symmetrical, you know, not just the vignetting, but uh, the way the astigmatism is showing up. And I know some of you are gonna uh, be shouting at your screens, bad copy, bad copy. The thing is, I bought this lens off the shelf. If you have to buy a lens from retail, uh, you should expect that the lens is gonna be good. It's gonna be within whatever the manufacturer has deemed acceptable bounds. And if you're experiencing a lot of bad copies and having to send a lot of lenses back, I would always encourage you to perhaps think to yourself, maybe this manufacturer is not putting the quality control necessary into their products. And this happens all across the industry. So if I can buy a lens at retail and this is what it looks like, frankly, as far as I'm concerned, this is what you can expect if you buy the same model from retail. But I'll get off the soapbox. So let's scroll here, f1.8, f2, 2.2, 2.5, 2.8. And here again, we see that things have cleaned up a little bit. It's more even brightness. We do still have pretty dark corners. And one thing actually, we'll just scroll back really quick. One thing that, you know, when you're viewing an image, you don't know that the star is shaped like a little fighter jet. You don't know. It doesn't really matter. Normal people viewing uh, experience these stars, you never really see the shapes. However, you do see their size and brightness relative to the other stars. So where astigmatism really starts to get in the way for me personally is when it's creating like this bubble or pop bottle effect where around the edges and corners, they're much bigger and stretched out and they appear uh, bigger and stretched out as opposed to in the center of the frame where they're nice pinpoints like they should be. And as someone who does a lot of time lapses, this can actually become really distracting because it looks like the sky is moving through some type of extra lens. And I find it distracting personally. So here, as we go through, once we hit 2.8, you'll notice the stars, the, the apparent size um, here are a lot more consistent. It's really great. However, we are at f2.8. It's an f1.8 lens. At this point, we can buy possibly a slower lens that has a less complicated optical formula and doesn't have to deal with so many uh, uh, inbuilt issues here. Here you can see the stars have tightened up in the corners a little bit, so they're not uh, quite as big, even though they're not round, and that's really where that's coming from. And uh, essentially, this lens is fairly compact compared to some of the other ones out there, but there is a reason why some lenses on the market have a huge bulbous front element, especially when you're dealing with wide angle primes, it's because you need that in order to get a nice even exposure in the corners. Um, this case, this lens focused on uh, being compact and not every lens needs to be great at astrophotography. Plenty of wide angle lenses uh, are used for things like, I suppose, daytime landscape photography. Uh, if anyone actually really does that anymore, of course I'm kidding. But so we'll back out of here and we'll go take a look at the corner test now. So what I did here is I put the star Vega as close to the corner as I could get and I focused on the star. And that's gonna help us uh, see not only uh, the worst of the worst as far as the corners are concerned because the brighter the star, the more it will show off the, the faults, but it will also help us assess if there's any field curvature. Field curvature is an interesting concept. It's where when something's in focus in the center, it may not be focused at other points in the frame. And if you focus at that other point, well, the center might be out of focus. So you might be asking why Vega? Well, whenever you're doing this type of star test, you want a bright star. Here we are in Star Night Pro Plus 8 by Simulation Curriculum. Nice planetarium software. And we'll just click the info button here. And you'll see absolute magnitude is 0.55 visual. And some of you are like, ah, that sounds familiar. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? And in the case of magnitude, magnitude is a way that uh, astronomy judges or classifies the brightness of a, of a star or other object as visible from Earth. And in this case, zero is high brightness. And the, the bigger the number gets, uh, you know, 
5, 10, 12, the fainter the star is. And if things go into the negative, paradoxically that means they're brighter. So if Jupiter's up in the sky, for instance, or maybe Venus uh, in certain parts of its orbit, it can be in the negatives, which means it's even brighter. But in the case of Vega, Vega is a really bright star and uh, it's really useful for this particular test. So let's zoom in here. And yeah, yep, that is not a star shape. That is not even a fighter jet. That's like a rainbow space fish. I have never seen that before. It's oddly pretty. There's a lot of pretty colors happening here. Um, well, that's what that is. Um, you can see here it's swimming with its school of fellow uh, little fishies. And this is indicating that sagittal astigmatism is not as prevalent here as compared to cha uh, tangential astigmatism. And here you can see the fainter stars, the sagittal barely shows up. It's all tangential. So very little sagittal, at, focused in the corners at least, and a lot of tangential. Yeah. And you can see as I click around the frame here, there's always going to be something sort of pointed in the direction of the center. Well, let's take a look at the center. And here, you know, these stars are pretty okay. They don't look out of focus too much, if at all. It might maybe a little, 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 little bit, but nothing really terrible. So I would say this lens actually probably has low field curvature. If you're focused in the corners, you're focused in the center and vice versa, uh, you might want to instead focus in this area. As we saw before, there's less distortion here anyway, and that might be a good compromise. So, but in this case, I don't really think it's an issue. So we'll run through here. This is f1.8, f2, 2.2, 2.5, and 2.8. And you see even stop down to f2.8, the astigmatism doesn't go away. It tightens up a little bit. So this is the sagittal astigmatism. This is the tangential. And it's still really prevalent around the frame. And the vignetting here uh, with the, I guess this would have been nautical twilight at this point. Pretty strong. But you know what? It is what it is. And you know, that's oddly pretty. A lot of these can be oddly pretty, uh, so there is that. But ultimately, a lens, no lens is perfect. A lens can only perform as good as it can perform, and wide angle fast primes are hard. So in the case of this particular lens, that's what you can expect. And you know, if you're fine with that, awesome. Get the lens if it's on your radar. And if this isn't for you, also awesome. There are other lenses out there. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just merely here to show you what the lens does and explain what you're seeing and let you make the decision from there. So what are my final thoughts on this lens? Well, I think it's a really well-built lens at an affordable price, especially compared to the competition, at least in Sony E-mount. Of course, you do have the Sigma and Sony lenses at 14 mil, which are as fast or faster than this lens with a little bit of a wider field of view. But all in all, I think this lens actually makes a really good showing. Uh, again, the caveat, especially at its price point, uh, to a certain extent you do get what you pay for and this shows up most in the image quality. The corners and edges of this lens do have a lot of aberrations and they don't really rectify as you stop the lens down. So that could be a consideration for you. Uh, of course, if you want the widest field of view possible, you might already be looking at those other lenses. And if you're interested in those, I should be doing reviews of them as well here, as well as a head-to-head -head with this lens. Depending on when you're watching this video, those videos may or may not exist on the channel already. But overall, I hope you found this useful. I hope it's given you some information uh, that you need to actually make a decision if this is the right lens for you. And I hope that you come back for some of those other videos. So thanks so much for watching. I'm Darren with Fervent Astronomy, and I'll see you next time.